Welcome to Crypto Slam Clubhouse, brought to you by CryptoSlam.io, the multi-chain NFT and digital collectible data aggregator, collecting data since 2018. Welcome to episode two of Crypto Slam Clubhouse. My name is Johan Kalfu, founding CMO of CryptoSlam.io. This week on episode two, we have NFT news with Yehuda, an interview with iconic grunge photographer, Karen Mason Blair, who's recent drop on dropping now.io is happening right now a trends and predictions discussion with justin huda and i and then lastly upcoming drops with justin johnson our marketing manager talking about the recent and upcoming drops that are notable in the nft industry thanks for joining us and enjoy the show first x copy and then kevin rose's moonbirds both considered the pinnacle of nfts announced plans of their move to the creative common space but while XCopy's announcement was met with open arms, the backlash from the Moonbirds community was palpable, as holders of Moonbird NFTs believed they were already sold the exclusive rights to their NFT's image. So I have to ask, is CCO always the way to go? Big brands keep pouring into the NFT space. Prada's upcycled clothing drop last week came with a paired NFT that gave holders the opportunity to attend a fashion show in Milan. Tiffany & Co. released their diamond and gem-laden CryptoPunk pendant, exclusive only to CryptoPunk holders. Tag Hire announced a new line of watches that function as an NFT display. Starbucks is planning to release an NFT rewards program, and Gucci will begin to accept the Board Ape Yacht Club's payment token, ApeCoin, as payment. Big brands, big value, maybe huge potential. A major hack took place on Solana last week, draining over eight thousand wallets of over five million dollars hardware wallets were not affected so secure your assets with the proper tools like a hardware wallet and always follow best practices meta is pushing forward with their plans to bring nfts to the masses via instagram and announced the partnership with the flow blockchain the home of nba top shot nfl all day crypto kitties and other major nft brands the flow tokens price jumped 100 percent on the news showing the positive reception from crypto investors Stay tuned to Crypto Slams Clubhouse for your weekly dose of the Web3 stories that matter the most. Welcome, Karen. Um, we're excited to have you on this interview. We just uh, released promotional materials for the drop on Dropping Now and, and uh, supported by the data on Crypto Slam. Thank you so much for dropping with us. And um, the guys are super stoked, especially Huda and Justin here and uh, the rest of the team. So we're hoping for a good drop and kind of like to start things off. Why don't you just let us know a little bit more about yourself and how you you became to uh, um, know some of the, the iconic uh, bands that you, you came to photograph? Yeah. Hey, well, thank you. I'm super excited about this. I think it's so cool. Thanks for asking me. And uh, yeah, my story, you know, it, I guess it's, you know, not that common, but um Actually, all the bands and all the guys and, you know, band members, they were all my friends. And, and um, of course, being a photographer in like the late 80s, early 90s, hardly anybody was taking photos, you know. And, um, and so once the band started getting signed, they're, they're, they're calling me and they're like, Karen, take our pictures, Karen, take our pictures. And then everybody's getting signed. Like, it was just like dominoes. It was just like, and so, you know, um, and, and, and I had lived in LA for a year. I had a studio in Hollywood and, uh, well, in downtown LA. And uh, I had just moved back from uh, LA. And so I, and, um, and that's right when the grunge thing took off. So now I have all these LA connections. So that's why I'm getting these calls from Rolling Stone and Entertainment Weekly, because I had met all these connections in LA and then, and then they didn't know any photographers in Seattle. Uh -huh. So I guess you just uh, knew how to operate a camera and just that, and just your, I, I mean, some of the shots are like, I mean, look at that shot behind you. How, that's amazing. Like, I mean, <laughs> how many photos did you have to get to get that one? Oh man, well that, <laughs> first off, never taken a photo like that in my life. And, you know, and I was standing side stage at, you know, Nirvana was playing the Paramount and uh, this is right when Nevermind's, you know, blowing up. They had been on this world tour and they're coming home and we hadn't seen them for a very long time. And they're shooting their HD video live at the Paramount. And uh, they didn't let any photographers shoot except me. 
And normally they don't even let any photographers shoot during a video. And so I'm standing side stage and I am like, holy shit. And I just like take it. And I, I just, I just saw it, you know, and, and literally this thing sat, this thing sat in my, uh, um, in my file cabinets for years because uh, really <laughs> the crazy thing is, is technically i'm not well maybe not technically but theoretically that there's just too much dead space right like <laughs> like a magazine would never print that you know and so i just kind of sat there because i didn't think anybody would be into it and then of course you know now we know the story and and you know it's called alone in the fame you know what is dead space dead space like like there's all that like there's all this black and like a magazine or like an editorial they, they want you to fill it with you know content and story and what you know they just wanted a, a full frame like um you know i don't know like back in the day we used to have all these magazines that you'd look through and they had all the you know like they'd have all these pictures of bands and all these live shots and and uh and most people just even just take one picture so you'd want to do a total close-up of kurt cobain and then you'd get uh. him like yeah. see his little beard and everything yeah i know but that's <laughs> huda i i mean you've got to be so ecstatic to be working with karen i mean you you're a grunge kid right like you grew up with this stuff yeah these are all my favorite bands and, and i recognize a lot of these photographs from from my time kind of in the scene too not in the personal way that, that karen's experienced it but this was my life i mean the 90s i was you know, not just into, into the grunge rock scene, but I was obsessed with it. It's kind of all I did was listen to these bands and read about them and trade their bootleg cassette tapes and VHS tapes to their concerts and stuff. And Karen's photos were on some of those bootlegs. So it's just really interesting, this connection we've made now. Um, I'm curious, I consider that photo significant. And I think you have mentioned that you're the only person on the planet that's photographed Pearl Jam's first ever show. I mean, outside of your collection of photos of them at that show, they don't exist. Did you know how significant those times were and those moments were that you captured or were you, did it matter? Well, yeah. So th the thing is, is I went to the Pearl Jam 20, you know, uh, you know, when they released that movie. And so we went to the premiere, you know, with Cameron Crowe and all that. And so uh, there's a part in the, in the movie, Eddie Vedder is standing in his hallway and he's pointing and he goes, here's a picture from my third concert. And I'm like, third concert I, and, and and I know that I've shot the first concert and so like a week later I, I called their manager and I was like hey man you know I got pictures from the first concert he's like Karen what he goes there's no n there's no known images from that shoot from that night and I was like oh I, like I didn't even know that like I mean I knew I shot it I just didn't know there weren't any and so uh, you know and then so then I just rolled out my entire uh, then I, I thought, wow, maybe I'm on to something. And I just rolled out my entire collection called The Flannel Years. And it launched in 2016. And, and literally 80% of the photos no one, no one had ever seen before. Wow. Uh, th that's your, is that your book? Is that correct? Yeah, this is my book. Yeah, The Flannel Years. Yeah, this is it. Karen, I look sure. for that book on Amazon. How come, what's wrong with them? How come they don't have that? It is on Amazon. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go again. And then Chris Novostelic, the bass player of Nirvana, wrote my foreword. Okay. That's wild. Incredible. Yeah. And then there I am with Kurt Cobain, if you can see that. Oh, no way. That's me and Kurt Cobain. And again, I took that photo. It's wild. And as as friends, these were your friends. This was your circle that, that you know, I think you kind of hung out with during those times, right? Oh, absolutely. Every night. I mean, it was just like, I always say like, you know, I, you know, I took photos of the whole grunge movement and it's like, I didn't sit down for 10 years. I mean, like literally every night it was just bumping. <laughs> so I got to ask something to Justin, actually, he's the youngest member of our team. Well, one of the youngest members. What do you think about all this? Like, do you, do you know who Nirvana is and did you hear about her room? You know? Wow. I, I feel like, I feel like you're trying me a little bit, but <laughs> I, I do. I do. I'm a big fan of Nirvana, probably not as big as Huda. Um, and yeah, the grunge scene, I, I missed it. I missed the wave, but then just kind of had to go back through the catalog. Um, lucky enough, I, I grew up and we moved around a ton. So I was introduced to a very diverse set of music um, and learning to play guitar by playing through ear, uh, playing, um, you know, teaching myself to play guitar self-taught. Um, I listened to new songs and drew inspiration from uh, people like Kurt Cobain and bands like Nirvana. 
Um, and so some of the bands I'm, I became familiar with just looking for cool stuff to play. So this is really just awesome for me because um, some of the photos that I've seen now making connections with the person on behind the lens is just fantastic. Um, so I, I guess I'm just curious. So as, as the years have progressed and you have these photos, um, what made you, uh, I guess, transition and, and, and decide to get into the NFT space and turn some of these iconic photos into these NFTs? Yeah, hey, that is a great question. Um, you know, it's like oh, it's, there was another photographer, and he and he wrote a book about uh, Kurt Cobain. I think I, I don't remember the exact title, and so I follow him. And then I was like, wait, what? And then he was the first one that I'd ever even seen do it. And then he released like you could, you know, he did he did he did this like massive drop of all these pictures. And I was like, wait, what's that? And then so and so then I just start, you know you know, emailing people like, hey, can I get in, you know, oh, can you help me? And, and then nobody, <laughs> not a single reply back, you know, for like three months. And then I was like, Karen, just do it, man. Grab some duct tape and start building something. And then so I had these Nirvana pictures because oh, I, I, I realized Nirvana, you know, like every Kurt Cobain thing is, is gone, right? And so I was like, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just roll these, these Nirvana, these Kurt Cobains out. And, uh, and so I did, and literally, like, I don't even know. I didn't even tell anybody because I tried to get a little bit of traction with, some, you know, with some like marketing or media, nothing. And then so all of a sudden they sell out, and I'm like, wait, what? So then I dropped some more, <laughs> and then and then um, and then those and then those sell pretty well. And then all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden, you know, Coldy comes over, buys one, the whole thing sells out, and I'm like, oh my god! And they sat there for three months before they were even discovered. So. <laughs> and that's exactly the point where I, I discovered your photographs too was actually seeing that Coldy bought them and I don't remember if uh, I don't remember if he tweeted it or somebody else retweeted that he had purchased but again I didn't see your collection until that moment I saw it I understood the I, I knew the bands I understood those moments and at that point yeah I went right in and I bought a mother love bone photo and I bought um, uh, uh, one of the uh, Kurt Cobain photos too and yeah, so many other like iconic shots that were already gone. So he did a great job of picking out some really great ones, but there's still tons out there. And, and I'm so excited that we have these um, Alice in Chains photos, which I've never seen these before. Um, yeah, it's exciting to have a collection. I think that this special um, that, that's coming here or is here now live on Dropping Now. Um, why Alice in Chains? Why, what is your connection with them? If you, if you could tell us a bit about that. Well, Alice in Chains, I mean, seriously, um, you know, great guys, you know, super fun. I mean, Jerry used to sleep on my couch, you know, <laughs> I used to give him a ride to band practice and old, you know, really Alice in Chains is my most photographed band. Like I, I saw more of their concerts, did more of their, you know, promo shoots and, um, you know, just really great friends. And, uh, you know, they're, they're still kicking it, you know, and I, I just thought, you know, for today or for this drop, I was like, well, let's start with Alice in Chains. Um, and so, yeah, I just was looking around. I recently did a bunch of scanning. And so I was like, oh, I got it. I got it. All these new ones, you know, because it's a daunting task to dive into your files from 30 years ago when you have, you know, just thousands and thousands of images. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to pick these ones. I, I don't really know why, but, uh, but I like them all. I mean, seriously. And uh, I can't, I'm, I'm going to roll them out through my Instagram because I like to like I keep my NFT and my other thing a little separate, but um, I'll, I'm going to roll them out, and I think the fans are just going to freak. <laughs> oh, they'll eat them up. They're they're phenomenal photos. They really are. Hey Huda, I want to ask you a little a question. Like, what does it do for you as a collector when you see somebody like Coldy buy that? And uh, a follow up to that is like, I guess, how does Karen know Coldy? So, I mean, it, we're all human beings, and we all have these connections, and and in in the NFT space. Unfortunately, everyone gets scammed sometimes and it's all, all, a lot of unknowns. So these kind of connections really do speak out loud when, when somebody like Coldy purchases the photo. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, but truthfully for me, it, it didn't mean a lot other than it, it, it just made me realize other people see in these photos what I see, which is, you know, there's, there's something special about the energy that's captured in them, that it's not just a picture of these people that I recognize, but man, some of those shots in that, that Kurt Cobain one is one of those. It has so much more. It's got the moment is in that film. Again, not just the person, but the moment. And I can feel it and I, it, I connect with it. It resonates in, in a much different way. So Coldy buying it, 
it didn't make me want to buy just because he did. It was literally just getting the exposure through him. Though I know a lot of people will buy just because of another buyer. Um, but again, significant photos, incredible shots. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. It's like, I think, you know, because I was thinking about, you know, you know, our, our conversation we're going to have right now. It, I was thinking, it's like, you can, there's great moments, right? Like there's historical moments, you know, like the Pearl Jam, that's historic, very historical moment. Like that is once in a lifetime of a band, they play their first show. And then, and then there's great, then there's this great photography, right? But when you put the great photography together with the great moment, then that's where it becomes iconic, right? So if you take a great picture at a great moment, then that's, that's the story, you know, that's, that's what we're all looking for, you know? And I think that crazy thing is about collectibles or about NFTs or about this art space that we're in now or the metaverse or all this is that, um, you know, it's like my images, people are buying them today. I'm already collectible, you know, <laughs> and, I, and people have been collecting my art for years, you know, so, and it, at 25 years, like, uh, at 25 years, things become collectible. And so, you know, Grunge just hit like 30, you know, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just getting going. <laughs> I think Alice and Chains is currently touring, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go to their show. Yeah, they're going to play here uh, in like three weeks. <laughs> Wow. And you're still in Seattle, Karen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. still in Seattle. Nice. Um, Huda, do you have any follow-up questions? Yeah, I, I do. I'm curious. I don't know much about the, um, you know, the physical art market, including photography. So I'm curious, do you have like repeat customers that buy physical prints? And is there in any way like an active trading scene? Like in my head, I don't picture that that exists and I might be wrong, but I'm wondering if that's something unique that NFTs do for you and for your, your collectibles, your, your photos that just maybe didn't exist before in you know, the, the physical space. Yeah, exactly. That's why, you know, that's why I totally like the NFT was very, uh, was very intriguing to me. You know what I mean? Because then you're like, wait, what? You get a like 10% every time it resells. Like that's unheard of out here. Now you can take your art, you can take your art and have it consigned. Like, you know, uh, like you, you can take it back, you can take it back to the gallery by which you bought it and then they can try to resell it and then they resell it. And then of course they take a fee, but but the point is, is like, if you're, if you're going to be in control of your art and we take out the middleman, which is just, you know, just, it's just, I, you know, like I, okay. So I just showed at the Seattle Arts Fair, which is this big arts fair, <laughs> you know, and I had these giant, giant uh, pictures, you know, Kurt Cobain and whatever. And uh, I mean, these frames were so expensive. And then, and then I was like, wait, what? Why does, why do they get 50%? And I'm not going to get 50% because that particular frame was hundreds of dollars, right? Yeah. And I'm like, wait, why, why is this, you know? And, and they're, oh, it's industry standard. And I was like, yeah, well, let's, let's change the industry. Cause that's a little unfair. Like, like what we, what would you sell if I didn't bring this? You don't, you don't have any art. I'm, <laughs> I'm your, your people are coming to see me. Like, I don't understand why I walk out with less money. So that's another reason why I've embraced this NFT thing. And then, and then everybody out here is so nice. And, you know, I might, like, you know, I, I've met all sorts of new people. I mean, Coley was in town and we, you know, hung out and, you know, and just everyone's just so fun and, you know, just, I don't know, we're just, we're just pioneers and let's just build something beautiful and different and kind, you know, it's so fun. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, that's a good point too about, you know, being pioneers in something, which this is now your second time being a part of a movement like that. I think there's a lot of parallels between what happened in the 90s with that music and how that kind of changed culture. And here we are, what, 30 years later, doing the same thing again, a little different. It's about technology, but I think it's the same kind of movement, the same type of significance. And here you are, you know, right at the front of it again. I think there's something really interesting about that and probably not an accident. There's something about the way you see things that, you know, it shows in your photography, but that you've been in those positions. It's, I don't think it's an accident. So just an observation I made. I want to get in. Super cool. I love that. It's totally, it's the same thing. I mean, if I, like, if I was ever going to describe the grunge movement in two words, it's love and support. And I was just going to ask, like, so I wasn't a huge grunge fan in high school. That's when it came out uh, and, and Nirvana smells like teen spirit was everywhere. Um, what was the grunge movement about in terms of like, so, so love and support can, can, 
Huda, what, what did that mean to you? Like, what, what was that? It, it was also alternative. Like, so you had rock and you had metal, but then grunge came out as an alternative. Like, what was that? Like, what, you know? So I don't think I thought much of that back then because so in the mid 90s, I was, you know, 15 or so. All I knew was I heard some sounds that changed me. I hadn't heard those things before and I connected with them just in a way I didn't know you could connect with, with music. So a lot of us, I think when we're younger, we have music that you probably spent a lot of time in and it did help shape, it did help shape you in a way. You spent a lot of time with your emotions at that age and then you find these connections with music and then that leads to you connecting with fans who also share that same connection with that band. And that's what it was to me because, you know, again, 15 or so me getting into them. And then a few years later, starting to become independent as a young adult and having the freedom to go follow the bands around, which I did. I would travel all around the Southeast, you know, and I'd go to Florida and Georgia and I would see as many shows as I could and with my friends that were local, but then all the friends that we met over the years, over, you know, 10 years of all of us from all over the country, touring, following the band, all of us flying up to Seattle together to go see them. Just, it just became a very special thing. So, so it still is to Karen's point, it's about friendship and love. It was about those things at, at the core. Absolutely. And I think like, I mean, okay, this is going to blow your mind, but can you imagine just driving down the street from your house or whatever, and you go to the local bar and you go into that local bar and oh my gosh, there's Nirvana. <laughs> then the next week, Can't even. You, go down, you, you drive down the road to your local bar and it's Soundgarden. And so one, one week, Alice in Chains is on stage, Soundgarden standing next to me. Next week, Soundgarden's on stage and Alice in Chains is standing next to me. And that was the movement. We had to support each other. And so, so then all your friends would come when you play and then you have to go see all your friends play because the, the, um, the clubs wouldn't book live music because they said there wasn't enough people going. <laughs> so then we said, oh gosh, you guys, we gotta go because we gotta listen to this music. <laughs> so that's it. So it almost became like a support, but also like this, competition to get like a voice that stood out from the other ones too as well right was that something they felt well it wasn't you know it wasn't competition that's what was so different about uh that was so different about about what's going on is that because then look at we they, they made temple of the dot right all those bands got together because we lost andrew wood then you know then they made mad season you know then you know and they, you know, you know, they made all these, you know, collaborations. So in actuality, like when I lived in LA, it was pure competition. Oh my gosh. You, you know, you, you know, you couldn't borrow a bass. You could, you know, you couldn't ask for strings from another guitarist. They'd be like, oh, hell no, we're trying to make it. But here in Seattle, they're like, oh yeah. Oh, you want to borrow my amp? Okay. Oh yeah. Put me on the list. See you there. Blah, blah, blah. And it was all like, that was it. Like we all were doing it together. And, and really the Grinch movement ultimately ultimately was like between three to 500 people only. But the mind blow about that is the depth of talent that were in that, was within that 300 people. The Kurt Cobains, the Dave Grohl's, the Eddie Vedder's, the Chris Cornell's. It's like, that's mind blowing. That's mind blowing. Yeah, well, that it, is... it really is. And, and all those bands you mentioned too are just, they, they are also part of that, that thing, that thing that shaped you know kind of music to this date and so yeah it was what mother love bone and and green river members from there turned into pearl jam and 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 temple the dog members of sound garden with with pearl jam and there's so many other examples of these bands even yeah so many other examples of these bands that kind of cross pollinate and they didn't care because it wasn't about the competition like like we mentioned it was about the the joy of it all and and i guess to some degree the significance of it just appreciating that moment um what are some of the, your favorite moments that you've captured on a film? <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, you have I so many. I know this, but I'm curious yours. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like picking your favorite song is like, you know, you, it's, it, it's a long list, you know. I mean, of course, you know, I love Kurt Cobain. You know, I mean, what, you know, I, I miss him. You know, what a beautiful person, you know. Yeah, believe me, you, you, everyone would have loved him, you know. Um, you know, they're like, was he depressed all the time? It's like, no. <laughs> Are you kidding? He would get his, you know, he would get up on stage and we'd, you know, he just get it all out. You know, like we'd go, you know, even us as viewers, we'd, we'd go to the show and we was just bang our heads and, you know, and, and like the grunge, the grunge, uh, like 
the songs, you know, the Grinch songs or whatever, like their content was way more authentic, like way more relatable, you know, to me, like, I, you know, and so, um, I mean, believe me, you would drive home after a concert and you'd be like, problems? I have any problems. <laughs> I just got them all out in my head. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, it just seemed like there was a lot of angst in the in in the in the songs, but then you're right, they just got it all out and 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 yeah, it, it created some awesome awesome tunes. So what's next for you, Karen? Like, um, you know, uh, you did a great drop with us, and we were hoping that we sell it out for you. And um, what's next for you? Like, how do how do you well, first off, what did you think about us and the Crypto Slam team? Maybe pat ourselves on the back here a little bit. Oh. Well, I am so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy you guys reached out to me. Seriously, like, like I have so much going on and it's not like I don't want to do this. It's just I don't have the bandwidth, you know, some some days. Right. And so it's been, oh my gosh, you guys have been so nice to me and treated me so well. And I've loved everything that you've made or written. And, and, um, and it's, I mean, it's just really cool. You know, I, I get to do this least amount of work and, you know, and have a really good time. And, and, uh, and I, and I, I, you know, I've, I, th I think I've met everybody on the team, but I, I love everybody. I mean, every, <laughs> everyone's good in their own craft and, you know, and you guys are treating me so well. And yeah, I mean, I just think it's a really good time. I mean, seriously, and I can't wait. I mean, I want to, you know, maybe we'll roll out some other bands. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead, I'm, Justin. I'm curious. I'm curious, Karen, um, do you have any advice for any photographers who have been thinking about releasing their own NFTs, but are a little hesitant because maybe the technology, um, you know, has them, I guess, they a, a little scared or intimidated, maybe would be a better word. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I would. <laughs> it was very difficult for me. Okay. <laughs> I have a really high IQ, man, but I was like, what is this? Like, I mean, you, there were just so many, you know, layers and dimensions and understanding and, you know, three wallets and this and that. And you're just like, what? The what? Like, it was just very overwhelming. I mean, I think they should come to, a, you know, a company like yours. I mean, like, I think, you know, I mean, I, I would never have done that if someone had gotten back to me in the beginning. But I was like, this is so cool. I just had to see, see what it was. But um, but it literally took me months to even figure it out. And, and I'm still not fully aware because it's just, it's just massive, you know? So yeah, I think that, you know, I, I you know, reach out to Crypto Slam and have them help you because, <laughs> because believe me, you're going to need it. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right, Justin. There's still a lot of people out there who have heard, maybe heard of NFTs, but don't know how it can affect them. Um, but just like Karen says, there's that royalty part of it that just makes sense. And, you know, I think it really does make sense from a collector point of view, too, because they want to ensure that they have limited prints and uh, it's there's collector value there and they're getting something that they know comes directly from the artist themselves. And it's not a copy or it's not a um, somebody releasing something that's not rich, uh, theirs. We can research Karen. We can go to her website. We can follow her on Twitter. We can interact with her. We can see, ask her about these photographs. And I think that's just unheard of. Uh, like you said, Karen, cutting out the middleman and, and direct to the artist, right? So um, yeah, hoping to help uh, or you know see more artists like yourself come in. But I doubt many of them have uh, shots like you do. So <laughs> well, you know, these days they don't, they don't, they don't even want you to keep your copyright. I mean, it's so sad. Like, like I, I don't, some bands I don't even go shoot because the, the photo release is so damn long. And I'm like, I'm like, wait, what? Basically I'm coming to shoot pictures and you're going to own every single one of them. And then, and then I won't be able to do this. Like you don't even understand, like, like, you know, so it's hard to keep your copyright today, you know? And so, um, cause then the band has to approve it. Right. <laughs> Oh, I gotta call the band. Like, okay, wow, I'm I'm high on the priority list right there. But um, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that leads to a good question. You obviously have permission from the bands to release these as yours. Well, I own the copyright. I mean, it's, it's filed with the Library of Congress. So, uh, so back then you didn't sign all this, all these releases, releasing um, the content to the band. You know what I mean? You you get to you get to keep your copyright. 
you know. So now, like, like I just got the cover of the, oh, I don't think I have it, the cover of the Nirvana album, you know. And so they, you know, so they had to call me and say, hey, can we, can we use that photo on your, on this cover? And I was like, oh yeah. And then they have to, then they have to pay me for it. But, but I think today, like, I, I don't think it's like, I don't think it goes like that. Let me see if I can find it for you. Oh yeah, right here. Right with the camera. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So then, so then they have to call and then say, oh, we'd like to license that from you. And I was like, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, let's uh, talk about the, the Alice in Chains uh, shots that you released. Huda, you, you gave some of those titles, um, or, or you work with Karen on the titles. Did you want to introduce a couple of the more memorable ones? Well, there's only five, but we'll put them up in, in the post-production, and uh, we can just like maybe talk about a couple of them. Yeah, maybe the, the very first one that, that um, we have listed on our blog, it is uh, Allison Chain's Grunge and Glam, which was, actually, I'll let you tell the story because it's an incredible story that I learned through you and through that photograph. Yeah, so it's like, you know, this is, okay, now Allison Chain's is signed at this point because they were the first band to get signed out of, out, of, out of all of them. And so, and actually Allison Chain's got signed like almost a whole year before they even, because Jerry told me that they were signed. He's like, well, we can't tell anybody because they're working out this, well, they're just working on this campaign thing. And so, um, so next thing you know, uh, they get a phone call from Poison and they're like, oh, the opening band isn't, you know, can't perform. I don't know what happened. And they said, would you guys open for us? And they're like, oh my gosh, yes. And they were just so and happy and the thing is is that Alice in Chains actually was a kind of like a they at a, at a certain point they were either going to decide to be a glam band or a grunge band and so they would they would do their hair I would do their makeup we would make their hair huge and they did glam for a hot minute and then and then once they got signed they told they went grunge but uh so they're just like oh my god they were our heroes <laughs> back then and so the next thing you know Alice in Chains opens for for Poison and then, and then they come out and they do an encore and then Poison says, hey guys, come on stage and we'll, and we'll play Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. And so next thing you know, you got Poison and Alice and James on stage at the exact same time. <laughs> like, I mean, actually an iconic moment. And I didn't know, I didn't know there was photos of it. I didn't know it happened that way. And, and I was, yeah, I got to learn of that through you. So thank you for that. That's Is that wild. the one in your um, monitor back there, Huda? Um, Boom. Yes. That's the one. Yep. Yeah. And let's it's an go to the other shot. It really is. And let's go to the other one that's on your monitor. That's, I think that's one of your favorites. I almost don't want to show it because I want to buy it. Guys, don't touch this. this is mine. He's but covering it up. This, this shot of Jerry Cantrell with the hair and just he's in this shot that is like completely dark except for him. And that's another one of those shots that is just I don't know that anybody else that could have been there and taken the shot the way you did, that you're able to continuously capture these, the moments. And, and again, the energy, there's something very unique about what, what you're able to do with these guys on a film. So that one feels like Jerry to me, but in a way that, you know, again, I don't think I've gotten that through in a photo before ever. So I love the photo. I'd love to hear, you know, what inspired you to take that shot. If it wasn't even intentional, or if it was, if you saw it kind of like the Kurt Cobain photo behind you, you saw it and you knew you had to take it. Yeah, well, with those, with, with live, you know what I mean? It's like, for me, and this is the great thing about Alice, is that, you know, I, it's like, after you go, you kind of know where they're going to, what they're going to do. I mean, they're, they're not, believe me, they're not like a boy band where they have something choreographed, but knowing the song, I'm like, okay, I'm going to wait because Lane's going to hit that note, right? And, or, or, you know, he's going to go, what? He's going to, and then I was like, that's the moment. So I, I mostly listen, I mean, I mostly like, I'm listening with my ears and I'm following the light, you know, then the other thing is it could be the moment, but then the light guy back in the nineties <laughs> did not have good lighting at all, just so you know, and especially in Seattle, oh my gosh, no. And uh, uh, it was really hard to get good pictures. And so Jerry constantly would just bang his head and he would just whip it around. And so I'm just like, come on. <laughs> I'm like, bring it. <laughs> yep. That is awesome. So I mean, that's just that is part of the reason why you're able to get those special shots because you know, you know, when maybe something a little more exciting or significant's coming up, and you're ready and re you're ready to take it. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and we have a couple more shots there, so nothing against those, but 
definitely if you know you know and if you're fans of the band you know those are epic shots so take a look at them on droppingnow.io um the links and the tweets are out there karen we're just so happy to have you on and we're, we're happy to to work with you because it's given this team a lot of uh exciting things and uh, we, we love helping artists out um, and, and using the technology. We just have a lot of expertise and we're just happy that we can help you out with it. So thanks again for, for dropping with us and um, continuing to work with us. Let's have you on at another point in time, hopefully, where we can talk about possibly another drop. But um, where do we keep up with you? Where, where do people keep up with you and find out? Um, are you on Twitter? Are you, do you have your own webpage? Drop, we'll drop it in the links below it. But if you want to say a quick thing on that and we could wrap up. Yeah, it's just, it's just my name, Karen Mason Blair. It's, you know, the dot com, Karen Mason Blair Twitter, Karen Mason Blair Instagram. You know, having three names, it's kind of nice. It's hard to get ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And you're linked in our tweets. So again, thank you so much. Um, we'll wrap this, uh, keep it, uh, keep it short for the viewers and it was short and definitely sweet and we'll, we'll stay on. We'll, we'll chat a little bit. Okay. Rock on. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. Hey guys, welcome to the NFT trends and predictions segment. Um, more fun stuff in the NFT world. Uh, I think there's a, a good um, few topics that we could talk about here, but there's one in particular that I feel like, and you and we agree, we've we've talked about this on our internal meetings, is that uh, the Creative Commons, the CCO topic, is red hot right now. Um, Huda, what do you know about that, and what can you uh, say that you've been hearing about it or um, feeling about that? Yeah, there's probably a lot to to say about this, especially how significant it is right now. And I I, I'll, I should say I've only recently wrapped my head around CCO and how you know how big it is of a concept and how kind of game changing it will be for man even projects that don't adopt it. It's going to be a conversation in probably every project. Should we be CCO? Should we not? Um, should we retroactively be CCO or no, uh, CCO or no, it's, it's going to get really interesting, but yeah, the significant story this week was the Moonbirds announcing, uh, that they are now CCO and, um, you know, there's a lot of passionate discussions happening on both sides of it. And there's great points all around and, you know, whatever side you're on, you're probably right about it. You know, like it, it's, it's, there's a lot of valid points all over the place, but I think there's an interesting point with what happened here, which was, did the Moonbirds, the, the team themselves, did they have the rights to actually make it CCO or did the buyers of the Moonbirds already own that? You know, this was done after they were sold, after 10,000 people or however many holders they have, after they've made the purchase, assuming that they own the rights, because I believe that's how it was sold to them. That when you buy a Moonbird, you own the rights to it. And um, after the fact to change that is a really, really hard discussion that, that is happening now. And that's going to keep unfolding over the weeks here, probably months, years, but it's a big topic. Justin, you're new to, to the NFT industry, newer anyways. I feel like you're probably a veteran now with, with uh, four months under your belt or so. But um, what do you thought, what's your thoughts about CCO and how does that, uh, how do you understand the licensing part of this? Man, I, I find it fascinating and I think it's it's extremely important. I'm, I'm glad we're getting into the, into the weeds of the discussions when it comes to intellectual property rights and NFTs as a whole, because um, I think it's extremely important. Um, to, to Huda's point uh, that he brings up, did Proof XYZ have the right to change from uh, providing IP rights to stakeholders to now Creative Commons where everybody has the ability um, to do what they want with these images? Um, that's a, that's, we have to have those conversations now. So um, <laughs> like you said, I, I'm, I don't think I'm a veteran yet. I'm still new to the space in my eyes, but these weeks feel like years in this space. So um, it's just really, really interesting to me, you know, from, from what I've been hearing um, on Twitter from some of the Moonhold, uh, Moonbird stakeholders um, is that there seems to, they, they seem to be feeling a loss of IP, uh, a loss of IP rights. So it's, it's a loss um, for them because to initially come into the project thinking that, um, that this is like a benefit, a value add to now everybody can use it. Um, I think it kind of does them a disservice uh, to a certain degree. Um, and I think ultimately it's, it's how you go about doing things a lot of times. And I just feel like 
NFTs is in Web3 in general is just so community focused that I believe there should have been more emphasis on community um, with how they went about making this change or before they went about making this very public change because you can't go back. You can't un CCO right. something. Once it's, once it's public and CCO is out there, Creative Commons, it's out there. Um, so you can't undo something like that. So this is a big shift and a big change. Um, and there, there are some, there's, there's some discussions about how they, how they wish they would have gone about that uh, from the stakeholders. One in particular, uh, a guy named Lacaz, um, he has one of the most rare, if not the most rare Moonbird um, in the collection. And he, he, he released a Twitter thread that I thought was really, really interesting and fascinating because he talked about how he was negotiating a six-figure brand deal um, that totally fell to pieces with the Moonbird's announcement of, of going CCO. Um, and the reason being because, so think of it like this, if I have the, if I own the intellectual property to my NFT and now I'm negotiating a brand deal, similar to how a lot of the board apes are, are doing with some of these brand collaborations that they're, uh, that they're been, uh, that they're um, developing um, and building brands off of. So if I'm developing a brand deal with, let's say Disney to allow Disney to feature my Moonbird in their new upcoming movie, or maybe they have a, a child series that's coming out or something like that. Um, because Disney is so, uh, they, they value their brand so much, they likely would not be willing to do that deal with a, with a CCO project just because after me making that deal and doing and, and rolling out um, some type of brand collaboration and now my Moonbird is featured in their movie, what if some another project that's uh, rated, you know, NC-17 or R or more so for kids uh, or not for kids or something like that, such as a Family Guy or The Simpsons or something, uses that same Moonbird in their in their show. And now you have this brand disruption. So I think we get into a liability issue when it comes to CCO working with uh, big brands and whether they choose to do that or not, um, just because liability is extremely important and brand integrity is extremely important for these billion dollar companies. I saw one project um, sort of make went halfway and they realized like, hey, we, we want to go CCO, but it has to be a community decision. Shonen Junk, uh, a project, uh, anime project, they rolled it out. And then literally within hours, they, they felt the blowback from the community and they rescinded that and then had a vote uh, to get that approved. And the community went ahead and voted for itself. So asking for consent is definitely probably the, the right way to have done that. Um, but at the end of the day, Huda... Do you think CCO or not going CCO is right for every project or is there a certain project that, that, that it can be good for? And what do you think the trend is? Uh, is it just a hype or is it there's real things to this licensing? Yeah, I think, you know, I'd like to see it on everything for the simple fact that I just don't like red tape. I don't like it anywhere. I don't like it, you know, in like when I worked corporate jobs, I didn't like it there. I don't like it in, you know, kind of the real world with taxes and legislation. I think the more red tape you get rid of, the faster we can get things done and evolve and grow and change and all of that. Um, so yeah, while the idea of it may not fit, you know, I guess people's mentality right now, I think it's great for probably every project. And that's not me taking into account that some of these have very specific things, something very specific they tailor their brand to. I know it's not going to fit everybody, but in my perfect world, it, it would be all of them. Um, but I am curious too, um, do, do, will we treat art differently that CCO? Will we have that same conversation about it and, and will kind of the collectors be so passionately maybe for or against it when it is art? Because a quick shout out to X Copy, he really got the conversation started just a week ago. Even though CCO has been a talking point in the space for, you know, since I've been in a year, year and a half, it was like kind of a minor talking point. And we've seen projects like MFers come in and they are completely CCO from the beginning, I believe. I think X Copy a week ago saying, um, one of his more recent projects, I don't know if it was Max Payne or which, but he announced that that would be CCO effective, I believe now, and that he's working to retroactively make all of his stuff CCO. I didn't see any backlash about that. So maybe it is that the fans or collectors like it, they can appreciate what it is. And maybe this still is a conversation about how Moonbirds actually changed, how they did it, you know, again, doing that after the fact. Um, but I think it will become the new normal. I've, I've said even, I think the next board eight tier project will be CCO because I think growing the base of people that can use your image, use that art, uh, I, I think it makes more sense. And there's more potential if there's 7 billion people that can use that and, you know, kind of put it into the mainstream and make it memeable and all of that. 
I think you're gonna have better odds of that happening with 7 million people than with um, 10,000, of which I'm sure just a, a couple dozen at most are actually trying to build around you know, that image. And, and truthfully, I don't think a lot of people are in these NFTs for the image itself. It's not, that's not the art. That's not the thing people are actually trying to you know, collect and save and, and enjoy. It's the token and the access and the perks and the community that you get from the token, not from the image. So yeah, it's an interesting conversation. Again, we'll talk about this for years. This will be one of the hottest topics in the space for a long, long time. It is, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a game changer and it will be for a while. Yeah, I really do think that uh, people who run collections are seeing like this allows us and our IP um, to blow up, to get brand adoption into the mainstream for uh, instead of instead of the creativity be centralized, the creativity is now decentralized with its community. Huda, you could use my MF -er to do anything you want, to be honest. You, uh, Justin, you know, you could use my MF -er, uh, but then again, I don't own my MF -er too, right? So there, there is that, there is that thing there. Um, Justin, what do you think about that? You look like you have something to say there. I, I do. I like, and I, I don't think there's really a wrong answer. I think it's more so an ongoing discussion as we see things unfold, but I, the more I read about it, the more I understand it more, I, I kind of feel like I'm on the opposite side of this. I, I think um, not that CCO is, is wrong. Um, I just don't know if it's right for every project in the sense right. that, you know, when it comes to luxury items or luxury brands or brands looking, if, if the utility is to, to have some type of luxury aspect, I think exclusivity and luxury go hand in hand to a certain degree. So a lot of times things are valuable because there's less of them or you, you, you have some exclusive rights to certain things. And I think that ultimately um, that's a piece of utility that I think is, is extremely valuable to a project that is, that is centered around maybe partnering with, like, like I mentioned, some more large scale brands. And I also feel like partnering with more large scale brands and bringing them into the web three space is really what it's going to take for mainstream adoption as well. It's not, necessarily allowing everybody to want to to allowing everybody the, the intellectual freedom to use the images because if it doesn't mean anything people aren't going to use them right so i think i think it's a combination it really depends on what your what your roadmap is what type of utility um you're trying to bring to your audience um as well as what your long-term vision is for the brand because these right. nfts even crypto projects they're all like these, it's, it's almost like owning stock or owning some stake in a brand itself and a company itself. So it's really just a matter of where do you want to take your company in the next you know, few years um, down the line and what type of community are you looking to build um, and how are you going to add value to that community? So I think when we have those conversations at the heart of those, I think that's where these conversations regarding CCO come into play. I don't think it's the right solution for every project. I definitely see some where it is, but I think some should probably give their intellectual property rights to their holders. Or when it comes to photographs, maybe you don't have any, you know, these photograph NFTs, maybe you don't give any intellectual property rights. You're just a collector because you love the art. So I think it just depends on the collection and the community and the roadmap. Honestly, I think that's where I'm, my, my sort of uh, stance sits on it. I, I do believe like there's uh, something um, for every project and CCO may not be one of them. Do you guys think that it had anything to do with the bear market? Because during the bull market, NFT bull market, CCO almost seemed like, hey, I'm giving this treasure away. I don't want to do that. So there's a, that's why there was only MFers that did it. There was only cryptodes. There was only uh, certain projects that did it. But now it's a bear, bear market. These projects are looking to like, hey, we need to get brand uh, penetration into the mainstream. And we need to do that at all costs. And that includes giving away our rights. Do you think that has anything to do with it? I, I wouldn't be surprised if that were a factor, right? It just makes sense. It's pretty brilliant marketing, if so. Um, it's hard to say what motivated it because that was coming. This conversation was coming one way or another. I think everybody felt that this would come to a head at some point and this would be a focal point for the scene. And here we are in the bear market with it happening, but I, nobody's surprised. And it wasn't ill-timed. It makes sense that this happened now because um, because it was such a, an important conversation that has been bubbling up for, for a long while um so yeah, does, it, does, the, does the right did the right click savers actually win on this this time uh who <laughs> <laughs> they might have they actually might have i didn't think of that but that's brilliant yeah they did in a way 
So it is interesting, but look, I mean, look at all kinds of creative things can come from this. Um, I don't know if this is quite the same, it might be, but Winnie the Pooh has publicly entered the public, has recently entered the public domain. They forgot to new, renew the license for it. It's now public domain. Somebody's making a horror movie of Winnie the Pooh. I mean, we would have never seen that before. And I think that's so bonkers. I think it's awesome. I, I don't see a downside to that at all. I really don't. Um, of course, whoever owned it before, I don't know who owned it, but I'm sure so protective of their brand. I'm sure they're devastated of this happening. Spoiler, the it's jar of honey, a... the jar of honey is not honey. Oh no, dude, <laughs> it really will get wild. I can't wait to see it. And that's the point of this is to breed creativity, to let, to, to unleash it. Let's see what right. happens. And in the end, I think when people have more freedom, um, there's just so much more growth and creativity that comes from it. So I just, I think it's a great thing to happen. I want to see it happen to more projects. I'll encourage anybody I know that is releasing a project to really strongly consider, you know, the CCO aspect. I push my brother with, you know, CyberCon. Like, could, you know, one day, do you think CyberCon CCO? I, I hope it happens. I really do. This is such a great conversation. I think I want, let's, let's have a follow-up conversation about this and invite some other people that I feel like, you know, could add a lot to here. So let's, um, let's put that, this one on the background for now. What else is happening out in the, in the industry uh, these days? I, I've seen uh, Tiffany drop something with the crypto punks. I've seen Starbucks coming out with, uh, with um, some NFTs. Or, or, or some Web3 uh, integrations. There's other big brands that I'm sure you're hearing about um, as well too. Is this a trend? Like, is this, a, is, this a, is this NFTs coming into the mainstream? Yeah, I mean, it's a trend. So those brands have been in for a while. Gap has been in and Prada and help me, there's, there's other just ginormous Nike, brands. Nike, we... Reebok. Nike, yeah. Adidas. All yeah. of them. I'm wearing my Adidas hoodie. I got this over the weekend. This is finally the uh, Into the Metaverse hoodie came in. And I've been excited for this more than any other. I don't care about clothes, but I care a lot about this. So yeah, those big brands are, are in, but this is different. There's something different about this where they're taking existing um, I guess IP, different uh, already existing brands in the NFT space, and they're putting it front and center on this shirt. They're putting it front and center on a watch, on a pendant, and that's what's mm -hmm. new and unique about this. And well, a lot of the space, they, they, they really knocked it. They didn't like what Tiffany did, but that sold out really quick. I want to say, I mean, it was day one. It might have been in within an hour, and they did millions of dollars worth of sales, and they knew their market. They they knocked it out of the park. It was, I think, a really great thing for the scene, because I do think that is also the new norm. It's part of that IP discussion of leasing out your images or using them for other purposes, and, and we're just getting a taste of that now. I, I love it. Yeah, it is really exciting to see these brands. Like, for example, that Tiffany uh, drop was tweeted out to 13.5 million people who probably never heard of NFTs before. So that's wow. just amazing. Like they did it from yeah. their main account. They didn't do it from an, an mm -hmm. NFT account, right? Wow. Didn't realize that. I didn't know. I mean, it makes sense that they're that big. It just didn't register. But that's the kind of thing that does bring in the masses. Um, you and I had talked last year about, you know, we, we noticed that when Mike Tyson switched his profile picture to the cool cat, do you remember the cool cat? The summer the the you know the summer of nfts last year that felt like kind of what what started it and it's because of the reach he has right. so not that this is going to kick off a bull run there's there's other things that need to happen for us to get back to where we were but it's one of the things that has to happen for that kind of growth to come so yeah yeah it's an interesting point justin do you have anything before we wrap this up um, no, I, I was I was just gonna say that you know as as, as major uh, as these major corporations are starting to realize the opportunity, you know we have these pioneers that have come in early, um, such as the Tiffany's, the Nikes, the Adidas, um, and so I just think it's 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 gonna keep happening, um, and it's awesome to me that it's happening in a bear market. I think yeah. the next bull run, it's gonna be a flood of these Web two traditional companies partnering and coming into the space just like that after seeing all of this success that happened in a bear market, it's a no brainer. The growth yeah. really does happen in the bear. And I've just been really keyed into that lately. I just know like crypto slam ourselves. I know how much we always work hard, right? But it is a different kind of thing that happens in a bear because you, you can focus on the work. You can focus on the growth where, you know, when the market is really cooking, it's full throttle trying to just keep up with trends all day long. And now, Again, I realize the bear market is where the real growth happens. So pay attention to all the news you see out there, because in a way, the news now in the bear is maybe more significant than it is when we're, you know, kind of in peak bull. That's right. a great point. 
Um, so that that's this week's uh, trends and predictions. Uh, stay tuned for our next segment. Now let's talk about some upcoming drops. First, we have Recurrent Scenario, who have partnered to release the Hello Kitty and Friends NFT collection on August 25th. Now this collection aims to create a virtual globe trotting experience across eight unique cities and features 10,000 NFTs, including Hello Kitty and five of her friends. Next up, Lamborghini is launching its third NFT collection called the Epic Road Trip. Starting this August, for one week each month across eight consecutive months, Lamborghini will drop a series of four NFTs. The collectors who hold each of the four NFTs dropped each month will earn a gold puzzle piece. At the end of the Epic Road Trip, collectors who have completed the puzzle will receive access to an ultra-rare exclusive reveal NFT. Now, last but not least, the iconic cartoon character Betty Boop is entering the Web3 universe. Fleischer Studios, Global Icons, and X-Label have all teamed up to launch Betty Boop and Friends. The NFT collection will be comprised of 8,888 one-of-a-kind NFTs featuring Betty Boop styled in digital high fashion designs produced by Miami Studios. Join our newsletter, NFTs on Deck, to stay updated on the hottest upcoming drops and future releases in the NFT industry. Now, if there's a project you'd like us to feature as an upcoming drop, please just let us know in the comments below. Crypto Slam has some of the most comprehensive data in the NFT industry. Contact us today to find out more about our free and enterprise API. Thanks again for tuning in.